Life during a pandemic and in a world so broken has left most of us needing renewal. Sometimes we press the power button to reset a system so it can come back refreshed. Our sermon series this fall, Renew, aims to equip us to power our faith with confidence and refresh our commitment. I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I want to begin today by inviting you to join me in taking a deep breath in, and sharing in a collective sigh together. So deep breath in and let it out. <sighs> okay, that, that's my sermon. Uh, th thanks for listening. Just kidding. I, I do have a point with this, though. Uh, I, I wonder if over the last year and a half of this pandemic time, of all the uh, chaos and uncertainty and everything else that uh, is wrapped up in all of this, if you found yourself from time to time uh, sighing like that, maybe sometimes without any discernible explanation. I know that uh, for, for me personally, I, I found myself on many occasions uh, letting out these um, audible, seemingly involuntary sighs uh, throughout the last year and a half. Uh, these sighs of exasperation, sighs of frustration, of confusion, of, of sadness, um, and what's really interesting is that in our passage today, the Apostle Paul talks about that moment when we feel like we're at a loss for words. Uh, he, he talks about this moment when we feel like uh, we don't know how to pray, we don't know what to say. And in this moment, uh, we l let out these involuntary sighs. And what he says is really interesting. Paul says that, uh, when we don't know what to pray, when we're at a loss for words, that the Spirit of God in that moment intercedes on our behalf with sighs too deep for words, is what he says. Now, that's an incredible phrase. It's an incredible promise. The Spirit intercedes uh, on our behalf with sighs too deep for words. Paul here is making this really bold claim that our sighs might in fact be a, a sign that the Spirit of God is present in our lives and is at work within us. It's an incredible uh, promise that Paul is, is claiming here. And Paul says something else in the passage. He says that uh, creation itself groans as if it were in labor pains. Uh, not just creation, he says, but we ourselves groan along with creation. Again, it's this incredibly vivid image of groaning as if in labor pains. Now, all of this, this language of, of sighs too deep uh, for words, of creation groaning as if in labor pains, all of this points to something uh, really fundamental and universal about our human experience. And that's that we have this sense that the world is 
not as it should be. That something has gone awry, uh, something feels off, the world is not as it should be. You know, we, we all feel that from time to time, and it's enough to lead us to groan, uh, to let out these sighs too deep for words. You know, just yesterday, uh, a small but mighty group of us from St. James headed off to Smithfield, North Carolina, to a farm there to, to glean some sweet potatoes. We were there with this organization called Society of St. Andrew, and the mission of this organization is to, uh, to intercept food that would otherwise be wasted and to divert it instead to our hungry neighbors who, who need it. Um, so thousands of farmers across North Carolina and across the, uh, the United States graciously allow volunteers to come to their farm uh, and to glean the produce that's been left behind after the harvest. And, you know, this is a really uh, deeply biblical practice, this practice of gleaning. It's rooted in the law of Moses. Um, in, in the Torah, you can read in, in our Old Testament how God commands uh, the Israelites to allow uh, the poor and the immigrants in their midst to glean the edges of their fields. Uh, they, they were commanded by God to leave that, that edge, that perimeter for the poor and for the immigrants in their midst. And uh, the Society of St. Andrew and, and these gracious farmers, they're, they're striving uh, every season to keep that biblical tradition of gleaning alive today. And our little group from St. James, we uh, joined a few other groups out there in, in the field uh, to pick these sweet potatoes. And instead of rotting in the field, um, we instead were able to gather thousands of pounds of sweet potatoes that are now headed off to different food pantries and ministries across the eastern part of the state. One of those pantries, of course, is our very own uh, St. James Food Pantry, uh, where we'll be able to share that with uh, our neighbors. Uh, now, this gleaning experience was uh, a stark reminder of a pretty sad reality, not just in North Carolina, but in the whole uh, United States. Um, it, it may come as a shock to, to hear that nearly 40% of all the food that is grown and raised in America is eventually wasted. Uh, it's an incredible statistic uh, that 40% of it is, is wasted. All of this while 38 million Americans uh, are said uh, to experience hunger on a daily basis. And that number includes 12 million children. Uh, and our, our gleaning on, on a farm in Smithfield, it was just, got to be honest, just a drop in the bucket in the face of such extreme waste and such unnecessary suffering. Um, and in this situation, this uh, incongruity here, if this situation doesn't lead you to sigh, I don't know uh, what will. The world is not as it should be. This is creation groaning as if in labor pains, and we groan with it. Sighs too deep for words. Once again, Paul makes this bold claim in the passage today, that those sighs of exasperation, of frustration, of confusion and sadness may in fact be signs of the Spirit's presence and guidance in our life. And when the Spirit of God is present, so too is hope. Hope is, after all, uh, the posture of the Christian. As Paul says, in hope we were saved. This is a particular kind of hope that Paul's talking about. It's not wishful thinking. This isn't a vapid optimism. Instead, the hope that Paul is talking about is, is this gift that the Spirit of God gives to us that enables us to both see the world as it is in all of its brokenness and then to hope for a world that will be. That will be. Now, Paul says we hope for what we do not see. In other words, this spirit-filled hope leads us to groan alongside the groaning creation. It empowers us to hope for what we do not yet see. Paul says that we wait for this that we do not yet see with patience, he says. So we might say that spirit-filled hope is a sort of defiant trust 
often against all odds. It's a hope against hope that God's future will indeed break into our present moment. It's a, an anticipation of a future peace, a future shalom, breaking into our chaos. Now, while our gleaning in the field on Saturday was just a drop in the bucket, it was yet an act of spirit-filled hope. First, the Spirit of God and empowered those farmers and the Society of St. Andrew and all the volunteer gleaners to see the world as it is in all of its brokenness. Then the Spirit of God filled us with groans and with sighs too deep for words. Finally, the Spirit of God compelled us all to, to choose hope in the midst of, in the, in the face of, a disheartening and a despairing situation. Our gleaning, again, though a drop in the bucket, it was a sort of anticipation of a world where no one goes hungry. It was a defiant trust that God's future will indeed break into our present. Now, the Spirit of God is a spirit of hope. And if we as, as followers of Christ, if we aren't filled with this kind of hope, uh, with this hope for God's future breaking into our present, then we must wonder what sort of spirit is actually guiding us. We don't have that spirit-filled hope. It, it can't be the Spirit of God that's guiding us because the Spirit of God fills us with hope for a world that will be. Now, I came across a, a story this week um, about a school in Shreveport, Louisiana. I think that's the way you pronounce it. Um, that had been experiencing uh, just this string of fights uh, breaking out among the students in the last month. Um, it was a really disheartening, uh, downright despairing situation there um, over the course of a few weeks in, in the last month. Um, and it would have been quite easy as parents to take to Twitter or to Facebook um, to complain about the school administration or the district or whatever, or to sit around and and bemoan kids these days. It would have been really easy to do all of that. Um, but here's the thing, uh, complaining doesn't require hope. And this was a news story because a group of dads dared to hope. Coordinating their, uh, around their, their work schedules, this group of dads uh, have, have begun showing up at this school uh, in rotations throughout the day with one very simple goal. Their goal is to simply serve as a compassionate presence there on campus, a sort of visible, gentle reminder of the community's love and support for the students and educators there. Now, these dads are, are present at the start of the day and in between classes to do very simple things, simple things like giving fist bumps and telling silly dad jokes and if needed, uh, casting one of those uh, looks that only dads can give uh, when someone gets out of line. Um, now, since their arrival, the school has seen this immense shift in the overall atmosphere. Um, there, there's a heaviness that's been lifted, uh, an anxiousness has subsided, thanks, at least in part, to this dedicated group of dads. Uh, this, this group has since uh, acquired or adopted the, the name Dads on Duty, uh, and they're, they're looking to start uh, chapters across Louisiana and maybe beyond um, uh, of Dads on Duty. Now, this group of dads, the Dads on Duty, they, they chose hope in the face of despair, right? It wasn't wishful thinking. It wasn't vapid optimism. There was no promise or guarantee that anything would get any better, but they had hope. And I believe it was led by the Spirit of God, that they shared this sort of defiant trust together, and this anticipation of a future peace breaking into the chaotic present. And sure enough, their patience paid off. Friends, here at St. James, we want to be a people united in hope. We want to be a people of spirit-filled hope. You know, my daughter uh, has this art teacher um, who uses this phrase that he likes to, 
to repeat when the students are working with, with glue on different projects. Uh, he likes to say, a dot does a lot. A dot does a lot. Uh, in other words, uh, you don't need a ton of glue to get the job done. I want to say today, so it is with hope. It is very tempting to see our sighs and our groaning at the state of the world around us through a very despairing lens. Uh, the, the world, yes, is not as it should be. There are, there's a lot out there that points toward despair and nihilism and selfishness as the only proper responses. Um, but like that dot of glue, a little bit of hope can go a long way. We find ourselves in, uh, sometimes in these seasons of, of doubt and, and despair. And when we find ourselves there, when we find ourselves in a season of, where we are at a loss uh, for words and we don't know how to pray, when in the face of all of these disheartening realities in the world around us and in our own lives, uh, and when we let out these, these involuntary sighs of exasperation, we can't lose sight of hope. So that's who God has called us to be, a people of spirit-filled hope. Our groaning, our sighing in, in exasperation and frustration and sadness, this may in fact be a sign of the Spirit's presence and guidance in our lives. Um, this is a sign that the Spirit has given us eyes to not only see the world as it is, but to also hope for a world that will be. This spirit-filled hope is our inheritance through Jesus Christ. It's a hope that God's future will indeed break into our present. A little bit of this spirit-filled hope can go a long, long way. Amen.